they, they, what they've done, they've educated me by giving me experiences. And the theme and the thread of the education is one of consciousness Conscious, itself. Consciousness. One of shared consciousness. Right. Uh, not just with one another on the planet, but with the trees, the plants, the animals, the whole of life, the ETs, our deceased members as we see them. That consciousness is a conduit for communication. And uh, one might even go as far to say that the, uh, our conscious energy is the true life form. And we are here in the physical to experience a physical life and learn uh, so it increases our conscious energy and our conscious understanding. And when we understand that, and you can extend that to the ETs, uh, if uh, it takes away any fear of them, because we all share that one consciousness, and uh, they're here to help us in that transition to a higher level of consciousness ourselves. We're being accelerated in our evolution, and to do that, we have to have an understanding of consciousness. And Absolutely. that's the thread that they've, they've, uh, they've given me. That is the crux of this whole conversation. That's the crux of every conversation I have on the show. That's it. You've just hit the nail on the head, Kevin. You've just put it all in a nutshell. That's it. <laughs> you got to accentuate the positive. Wow! I feel good. A little bit of feel good goes a long way. You're listening to Karen Swain, teacher of deliberate creation, accentuating the positive, showing you a way to a better life. Accentuating the positive, it's not just bad, it's sanity. Who in their right mind would accentuate anything else? Hello and welcome again to another show, Accentuating the Positive with Karen Swain. Oh boy, do I have someone fascinating to introduce you to today. His name is Kevin J. Briggs, originally from the UK, but now living in Florida, USA. Welcome to the show, Kevin. So great to have you on the show. Thank you, Karen. It's an honor to be here. And uh, I'm very pleased that you asked me to be on your show. Uh, <laughs> I do enjoy talking about my experiences now and uh, I enjoy it. Uh, tremendously and I'm getting the message out there that I have to share so thank you again for inviting me on your show. I'm very excited about you Kevin you remind me somewhat uh, your mandate your mission here on earth somewhat similar to Garnet Schulhauser same same but different in that you've both um, anyway we'll get into your story you're kind of the same but different completely different in many ways let me read your bio and tell you a little bit about Kevin Kevin J. Briggs is an author and specializes in consciousness and the connection to ET and UFOs. He recently published his book titled Spiritual Consciousness, A Personal Journey and covers 56 years of his experiences of ET contact and UFOs, connection, UFO connections. How do we know we are conscious is some of the questions that you pose. Some people never achieve knowing about consciousness. Some people find it hard to understand and believe. So this book uh, is for people who are curious or perhaps they themselves have had an experience that they cannot explain and don't know where to turn. You're not alone, you say. Kevin speaks to many groups of UFO and ET enthusiasts who are always eager to hear his interactions. He's written articles which have been published in Truth magazine and uh, his published book was also mentioned in Psychic News UK. Kevin has appeared on local radio stations and recently filmed a TV show called Unlocking Your Limitless Life. That sounds fascinating. I'd love to hear more about that, Kevin. Yes, it was fascinating. Yes, I still keep in touch with Susan Schatzer, who was the presenter on that. And uh, um, she's a very vibrant person and she's promoted the ET consciousness and contact. Uh, and I was introduced to her. She was given a message by her guides uh, to come and meet me. And we met and then she asked me to appear on her TV show. And um, we did a show quite a few months ago. In fact, it was last year, I think. And um, uh, so, yes, very interesting. A very interesting person. So, oh, okay. So the TV show has been, was it aired on mainstream TV or was it on just on in the internet? 
No, it's all, it's just on the internet. And actually, I don't think Susan's actually aired it yet. She's waiting for the right time and date to air it. Uh, ah. So I'm happy whenever she airs it. But it's it's just about the book and uh, very similar to what you're doing yeah. uh, about right. the ET. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, and you've also uh, spoken at conferences last September at the Miami Free Conference, Contact Experience Conference, hosted by Edgar, uh, the Edgar Mitchell Foundation of Research and Extraterrestrial and uh, Extraordinary Experiences. Um, look, you know, you're also a conscious channel. Um, when I say conscious channel, you are not, you are aware when you're channeling, like you don't leave your body and then have no memory and come back, right? I have uh, different modalities of contact. Uh, I've been able to travel outside of my body uh, from the age of uh, nine, and I believe that ability was given. We all have that ability, but that was an enhanced by my ET guides when I was nine. I'm also able to channel now, which is a more recent occurrence, probably in the last three years, where I'm able to channel uh, some of the guides themselves. Uh, I am aware of what's going on around me, uh, I'm not. I'm separating my consciousness to allow them to come into my physical and use their consciousness to speak. Uh, they call it uh, dual conscious physical communication. So, but that's a new uh, contact modality for me in the last uh, three years. Uh, up until that, it was say, out of say body. that again. That's a great title. Dual consciousness. What dual conscious. Physical communication. Lovely, I like that. Good so we've got, consciousness, we've got mine and I move it to one side and their consciousness comes into my physical and allows them to speak through me. Yeah, which is unlike an unconscious I, channel who not only moves their consciousness aside, they leave the building. They kind of say, see, you, I'm going flying around the universe. You can take over the vehicle. Okay. <laughs> So anyway, okay, well, let's get into your story because you've had uh, many experiences. It started when you were a child and um, I want to talk about them, but I, I also wanted to talk about Susie Hansen. Have you met Susie Hansen from New Zealand? No, I haven't, no. In your travels? Well, she is an experiencer. She's written a book called The Jewel Soul Connection and she's coming into the Inner Sanctum coming up. I have our online sessions where I invite a guest teacher. I'll invite you to come in next year, if you like, to meet a little tribe of people okay, that awesome. um, are members of my Inner Sanctum tribe. And we talk about consciousness and deliberate creation and expansion of awareness and all sorts of things. Anyway, Susie's coming in. She's been on the show. She talks about the three waves of volunteers. And she talks about the second wave are the people that have had a lifetime of experiences that are now coming out to share their experiences with the world and as they share their experiences the world awakens and you're very much one of because you've only just started talking about it since you wrote the book you've sort of kept it under your belt for a long time i have yes well perhaps i could perhaps i could expand on that if i start from what made me write the book and then go back to the beginning where i originally started it was a few years ago now about three years probably I got up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom, came back into the uh, bedroom, I got into bed, and I was just about to snuggle down into bed when there was a bright light outside the bedroom window. The light came into the bedroom and lit up the whole of the bedroom like a myriad of butterflies. But it was just pure white light. And then Orton D, two of my ET guides, materialized at the bottom of the bed. Now, bearing in mind, I'm used to seeing them, I'm used to interacting with them, so after uh, introductions and pleasantries, I asked what was the reason for their visit. And they said, Kevin, we want you to uh, talk about your interactions with us, to share your experiences. Uh, and we would also like you to write a book. In fact, you will write two books. And uh, I said, well, I don't mind talking about my experiences with you, uh, but I'm not a writer. <laughs> and they said, well, we will continue to guide you. We will continue to teach you and we will give you some information to include in the book, which they did. The following morning, I woke up, I told my wife that I was going to write this book, and I started writing it the following day. Uh, I managed to get it published, and it was published last May. It came out last May in last year. It's just been out over a year now, and uh, since then, I've been speaking to different groups. Um, I've spoken at different conferences, 
and I'm surprised at the interest in the uh, uh, my journey, really. But if I hadn't have been asked to do that, um, I probably would have gone to my grave without telling anyone of my experiences. My wife knew, my uh, brother knew, but no one else did. I was just happy with interacting with my extended family. So that's the reason why I wrote the book. And after 57 years now, they never asked anything of me. They've shown me many wondrous things uh, and interacted with what I call uh, my extended family. Um, just as you will go and visit your aunts and your uncles, uh, I go and visit my ETs and they come and visit me as well. So, uh, so that's how the book became to be written. Um, but my actual journey started when I was three years old. Uh, my mother engaged a photographer, photographer to come and take some photographs for the uh, family album. And uh, the photographer came, we were duly washed and hair combed, placed on a, an oak table, uh, quite an elevated position. And, and from that position, I looked around and not only did, did I see it from a different perspective, I realized that I was conscious and I realized I was conscious again in a physical body. I told my wife that story many, many years ago. And she said, Kevin, three-year-olds don't know about consciousness and three-year-olds don't think like that. I said, well, I did and I do. And that was the beginning of my own conscious journey uh, as a three-year-old. So, uh, um, and I think I have a photograph of me at three with the actual photograph. I mentioned it to my brother when I was writing the book and he said, I have that photograph. So he included it in the book. Oh, lovely. I know I haven't had a chance to look over your book yet, okay. uh, but um, I'd love to do that actually. Uh, have a read of it. I should have done it before the show, but anyway, timing can't read everybody's books. But okay. yeah, so uh, it's it's beautiful that you say you thought that you were going to go to your grave just having told maybe a couple of people. But these experiences didn't happen for naught. You know, the similarity between you and Garnet is that your spirit guide appeared to you and said, "Right, it's time to get into action." Yeah. <laughs> you know. <laughs> so Absolutely. when you when they appeared, so there's two of them, right? You, what are their names? Alt. Ort, O R T, Ort. That's the name. O R T, Ort. Her name is D E E, uh, and she's female. Ort and D, Ort and D. Yes. And where are they from? Uh, they're Arcturians, they tell me, and oh, they're from Andromeda. Okay, Arcturians. And what do they look like? Well, they, uh, well, if I tell you the story of how I first met them, in that, I will describe what they look like. On, okay. my, on my first occasion when I met them, I was eight years old. I was at home. I was having my weekly bath, which is what we used to do in those days. I don't know how hygienic that was, but we had a weekly bath. The rest of the time, we were sponged down with soap and water. And I was in the bath on my own, just enjoying myself. And as a child, I was always aware of the different vibrational frequencies around me where I was stood within the room yeah. and there was a change in the vibrational frequency and I picked up on it straight away there was a, a change in temperature which usually occurs and uh, I looked to my right hand side and there were two beings stood there slightly elevated off the floor about eight inches probably maybe 12 inches both very attractive long blonde both had long blonde hair both had blue eyes uh, and I say very very attractive and uh, they were wearing a tight-fitting blue, what I call a jumpsuit. Yeah. They were speaking to one another telepathically. And I remember the conversation to this day. I didn't put it, include it in the book. I think it says, she said, D said to Art, are you sure this is the boy? And they were talking to one another telepathically. And I was obviously listening to the conversation. And he said, yes, this is a boy. And then she said, uh, are you sure? Uh, she said, he's, uh, he's, just look at him, he's small, he's uneducated, and he's frightened by our presence. And she was correct, I was terrified at the time. And Art said, no, this is the boy, I will guide him, I will teach him. There was some other conversation, and then they, uh, they just disappeared. No direct contact with me, other than me listening to the conversation. As I said, I was terrified by the event, and I just stayed in the bath. I didn't get out of the bath. The water went cold. 
My mother came to find out why I was still in the bath. She came in and said, what are you doing? I said, well, there were two beings in the bathroom and I didn't get out of the bath and the water had gone cold, I was shivering. She said, don't be silly, it's your imagination. So uh, she dragged me off and, uh, and then I obviously went on with my evening. So that was my first physical encounter with Orton D. And uh, I've been in contact with them all my life. Okay, so they were observing you, but they weren't really interacting with you at the time. They no. weren't saying, you know, hello, Kevin, it's okay, we're here with you. No. So, um, which is kind of odd, really, uh, trying to, you know, soothe your worried mind as, a, as an eight-year-old. What, um, they knew that you could perceive them, so they, yeah, it's kind of well, odd. clearly, you know? yes. And they, they, she clearly picked up on my fear uh, yeah. because she mentioned it, you know, yeah. so... Yeah, probably a, a strange start, but uh, um, I suppose my next experience, I'd be nine years old, about uh, just a year later. And on that occasion, I, I remember it again, quite, I remember it all, really. Uh, on the, it was a Sunday, and I had some friends around to my home, and we were playing. Uh, the friends were leaving, it was uh, early evening, and I turned back and came into the house, and I could feel an energy in the house. Again, nothing unusual for me, but it was quite a strong energy. So I went to look around the home to see if I could see who was here, or there, should I say. And uh, I went upstairs in the bedrooms, back down in the kitchen, back into the living room. And then I, uh, for some reason, I was drawn to the window. And I looked behind the drapes or the curtains, and uh, there was this orange-yellow orb behind the curtain. It was about four to six inches across, and it was slightly vibrating. There was no communication at all, um, but it remained in the house until the following Friday for a whole week. I have no recollection of any communication with it at all, but after it left, my psychic abilities were enhanced no end, where I was able to leave my body and separate my consciousness from my physical just at will, and I would do that generally at the weekends uh, to visit my grandparents, I would leave my uh, physical body, fly over to their home, I would go upstairs uh, and sit in a, a chair that they had in a dressing room in the master bedroom upstairs. I would sit down and watch them through the floor, which was opaque. My grandmother would usually be in the kitchen cooking on a Sunday, and my grandfather would be either reading the newspaper or watching the TV. And I did this as a child every week, and I, at that time, I thought that was quite normal. Everybody did that. It was just another one of our senses, you know, taste, hearing, sight, smell, touch, and out of body. Oh, Kevin, wouldn't it be great if it was? I mean, I can see a day when it is just another one of our senses and we can all fly around in our astral bodies at will. I don't know when that's going to be in the future, but obviously it happens. Uh, in ET environments or higher dimensional or other Earths or, or other, you know, planets or whatever. But it, it's, uh, it talks about, you know, how we're never alone. I mean, who knows how many beings, be it spirit beings or astral beings or ETs are sitting here watching us eat our breakfast or do exactly, all the things yes. that we do. <laughs> I know that when I have these shows, I have a big mob that turns up to listen, you know. They yeah, okay, well, well, I find that I think... up to. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I, I'm exactly the same. I find that uh, if I'm talking about it, they will turn up. And sometimes other people will see them and I don't, which is uh, oh, yeah, uh, yeah. interesting. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, okay, L let me get back to your childhood experience. So at nine, when you saw the orb, that's when all the psychic ability and the out-of-body ability kicked in. So the orb sort of shifted something in your DNA so that you could at will have this experience, not explaining it to a nine-year-old, but... So a nine-year-old is just thinking, oh, this is cool. This is what happens when you're nine. <laughs> <laughs> Did you discuss it to, with your friends at school? You're like, oh, you know when you leave your body and you go to your grandma's house and they go, no. <laughs> I did try to find other people that were uh, able to leave the body and travel outside of the body. But I asked in a third party. I always said a friend of mine says he's able to leave his body and travel and he sees his family and friends and they always used to say, no, he must be exaggerating. No, nobody can do that. And then um, when I got to about 16 and 17, I actually asked Orton D 
for more information and then because I couldn't find any and then they came and gave me more information but that the orb I now know uh, I sub subsequently found out that was Ops pure was conscious energy on that was his energy. so he came as pure conscious energy on and I always wondered when I sat up there in my grandparents um, uh, dressing room in the master bedroom what they would see if they came upstairs and I now know the answer to that question they would have seen uh, an orangey yellow orb slightly vibrating uh, and that would have been my conscious energy orb well, well, they might not have seen it yet. They might have seen it because I think that uh, I think that people like you who have experiences where they can see through what they perceive as their physical eyes or outside eyes have have had adjustments to the rods and the cones in their physical apparatus to perceive a broader band of frequency. And and I think that the majority of us don't have that ability. Otherwise, we would see orbs and things, you know, spirits and astral beings everywhere through our outside eyes. I think a lot of us perceive it through our third eye, which is how I see. I don't see. I do see lights. I see points of lights and sort of blurry orbs, but not. it doesn't ever stay so that I can just look at it and go, oh, hello, you know, like it sort of disappears. I see it more through the peripheral. And apparently the cones and the rods in our eyes have a different, like they're a bit stronger in the peripheral vision than they are. I don't know. There's, there's a science to it, which I don't quite understand. But, um, yeah, they would have perceived, you would have looked like an orb, yeah, if they could see you. Yeah, yeah, beautiful. All right. Um, so let's continue with your story. Okay, um, well, um, I um, probably my next encounter would be, I would be, uh, 14 and yeah. uh, another six late years later um, but bearing in mind I'm enjoying my uh, life as a child I'm enjoying traveling outside of my body thinking it's perfectly normal are you and still in the UK at this point at 14 I'm still in the UK yes yeah, still yeah. in the UK mm. and uh, at this time I had a paper out and every time I went out to the house on the morning to do the paper out, there was always a UFO above the house I'd always look up, see the UFO, and I'd set off to get, collect my papers. And the second UFO would always come along uh, from probably the opposite direction. They would come together and follow me around the paper route. And uh, this was almost every day. And, uh, and while I was walking around the paper round, I was aware that there were other beings with me. They were either the other side of the heads, the other side of the wall, but I could feel their vibrational frequency. I knew they were there. And at one point, I got a little bit paranoid. I thought they were following me. And I realized later, they were following me. They were wanting to communicate with me. And then on one occasion, I plucked up the courage. And I said, look, I know you're there. I know you're following me. Um, uh, why don't you show yourself and communicate? And two small, what I now know to be greys, came from around the hedge and spoke to me. Uh, they said that I asked them what they wanted. I wasn't frightened. Uh, they were about the same height as me as a 14-year-old, but large heads, just like greys, but I wasn't frightened by them. And they said, oh, there's a group of people that would like to meet with you. Um, would you come with us? And I said, well, um, I've got to finish my paper round first. Uh, I said, I've nearly finished. I've just got a few more to deliver. And then I have to be back to school for 9 o'clock. Uh, so I said, I can't be away too long. They said, no, okay, we'll take you and you won't be late way too long and we'll bring you back and you'll be in time for school. I said, right, okay, then I'll go with you. So I went with them. <laughs> we went in a craft up to a mothership and uh, I only know it was a mothership because when we pulled into the hangar, it was huge and there was all these different sizes of, of craft there uh, and it was huge. And... Uh, uh, we got out of the craft, they escort, escorted me towards uh, a corridor, and I was walking through the hangar, there was a, another small grey working on one of the craft, he's a, a technician and a pilot, I know him now, I've met him since, and he waved at me, so being polite, I waved back, there was no communication, but then we were led through this corridor, and through another corridor, and I went down to an amphitheatre, went into this big amphitheatre, and it was full of all different species of beings. And at the bottom of the amphitheatre uh, was a stage with a semicircular table there, 
And at that table, there were eight beings. And these were the eight beings that wanted to meet with me. And I thought at the time, they just wanted to see the small human boy. Uh, they were just interested in what humans look like. I realized now it was much bigger than that. The eight that actually were sat at the front of the uh, amphitheater are a council, a council of eight that are responsible for this quadrant of our galaxy. That's what it is. So I was introduced to them as from the left to the right. Um, and I was okay until I got to uh, one of the beings was a mantis. And uh, I was a bit frightened, a bit perturbed by that because he was uh, uh, very strange looking to me, like a large grasshopper. How tall was he? Yeah. He, uh, well, they were all sat down, so and he didn't stand up, so I couldn't uh, uh, gauge a height with him. But uh, it was just the fact he was a very large insect, really. But I got the impression he was very intelligent, and I have met him since, and uh, I have communicated with him. And uh, um, what's his name, or what does he call his name himself? Is Chica. Chica. And Chica. how tall is he? Like we've well, met him since. Have you seen him stand up? Um, let me think now. Now you mentioned it, I probably have, yes. <laughs> yes. I remember meeting him once and I asked him if he was a, an entomologist. And uh, he uh, he looked down on me. Yeah, I, could, I could see it now. He looked down on me. And um, you know that look your mother gives you when you've done something that's... Uh, a, done something that's wrong and she's chastising you. And she gives you that look. He gave me that look of... You know, uh, no, I'm not an entomologist. Uh, he didn't say anything else. But yes, he was stood up then. So he'd probably be, say, about six foot six, probably, maybe well, seven foot, maybe. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, but um, I haven't had a great deal of interaction with him. But some of the others I have, um, obviously, Alt and D were part of the eight. They were sat on the left hand side. And then there was uh, Anna. She's a, uh, uh, looks like a blue avian type bird, and uh, she's very um, compassionate. In fact, when I was uh, introduced to Chica, the mantis, she stood up and came around and walked around to me and put her arm around me because she felt that I was concerned about uh, being introduced to Chica. Uh, and then we, we moved on to Zar. Hang on, hang on, let me get back to the blue avian. So what does she look like? Oh. Or, so this no. is a 14 year old memory and you haven't yeah. seen them together like that that you can remember since you were 14, right? Yes, yes. I have met them before. In fact, not so long ago, I, was, I went looking for them because I haven't heard from the group for about two or three weeks. And I went looking for them. I couldn't find them. I came back into my bedroom. When I say I went looking for them, out of body looking yeah, for them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When I came back, about a couple of minutes later, all eight appeared in my bedroom, uh, okay. looking down upon me. And uh, I said, oh, I've been looking for you. Where have you been? And they said, yes, we know you've been looking for us. That's why we're here. Um, oh, okay. Well, let's get back to that story. Let's go back to the 14-year-old <laughs> you being introduced to the eight. Okay. What did the blue avian type look like? Right. Okay. Well, I will describe it as uh, she was about probably... I'm going by my height when I was uh, probably five, five foot five or something like that. Not very tall, uh, very small, tight blue feathers, uh, normal size eyes, I would say. Uh, and she had a, a beak, but it was a. Uh, I've looked at some photographs on the internet, and they always show the blue avians with like a uh, a chicken beak, but her beak was a uh, like a duck beak, uh, but not as uh, it didn't protrude out that far. But it was a, certainly a duck shape in its uh, that's so that way. Yeah. If you could imagine, like the, you know, sometimes the um, the indigenous tribe put plates in their lips and they have these. Yes. Yes. These that's big a good, sort of that's yeah. A good analogy. Yes, mm -hmm. that's an excellent analogy. Yes. Okay. Right. So, uh, there's no there's no pictures on the internet of that particular type of blue avian. Uh, I'm not sure why. Perhaps nobody else has seen her, but uh, uh, but that's the image she shows me. Yeah, that's the image. Okay, so you've got the mantid, you've got Ort and D, who are like, they're tall. They're what over six foot. 
probably uh, no, probably six foot R and D. Uh, not much taller than I am now. I'm about uh, 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 so about the same height as me. So they but appear they humanoid. They appear humanoid. Oh, but yes, human. yes. Beautiful with they long tell. blonde hair, or or at That's least. Someone, yeah. Yes. Yes. They tell me I'm part of their extended family. The only difference is their physical is in the fifth dimension and my physical is in the third dimension. But is I this, am part this of This particular family. physical is in the third dimension. This particular physical that they're interacting with. Yeah. Okay. So, all right. So we as humans are able to perceive fifth dimensional physical through our physical eyes. Is that well, a well, you could. Know. Is it, can everyone do that? Um, you know, I, I wonder about this. I, I don't wonder. know, really. Um, I, um, well, maybe question. we can. Uh, uh, maybe we can do a bit of a channeling, and we can ask some questions <laughs> like that. How do you feel about that later? A bit later after you share your story. Okay, I have to think about it. If I'm going to do a channel, I like to prepare mentally for it, and I like to decide if I can or who will actually communicate with me. Um, so and i have done it when i've been on the spot a few times and i always find that the connection is not as good as if i'm prepared for it now they're saying sense? don't worry it'll be good it'll be good <laughs> you got don't worry there's, you got me with you that's, that's it's all good okay okay so you've got those three and who else was on the on the committee on the on the couch? okay well the the, uh, the guy sat in the center was called ra and he spells his name r a h uh, he's Anunnaki, and he leads the group. Um, quite a powerful. He, he, he leads the group. Did you say? He, he's the leader, yes, of the group. Mm -hmm. And then uh, to his right, from where I was looking, uh, would be Tag. He's a tall grey. Uh, he's responsible. He tells me he's responsible for the security, uh, not only of the Council of Eight, but the security of this quadrant of the galaxy and the different species. And then uh, obviously Chica, who I've already mentioned. And then last would be Orla. She was a tall white. Uh, and that's the group of eight that I've interacted with uh, all my life at different stages. But the main guides and teachers are Ork and Dee. So what does the tall white appear as look like? You know, I want to um, say, look, because I, mean, I, I think that, we we could all probably look at them and see something sort of different, really. Yeah, I, I would say again, probably yeah, six, just maybe six feet, just taller than six feet, possibly a, a longish neck and a, a smaller type features in the face, but with this long hair uh, that looks um, how would I describe it? Uh, opaque, like um, plastic tubing or something. But uh, uh, that's how I would describe it. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, plas plastic tubing is it's probably a poor description. Uh, hair that's hollow. Hollow hair. Hollow hair and no paking colour. Almost, yeah. you can almost see through it. I've got it. Yeah, they've given me an image. Oh, okay. Um, okay, that's all, good. Then. All right. Um, and where is she from? I don't know specifically where she is from. Uh, I know some are from the uh, 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 Pleiades system, from, some from Sirius, and obviously Andromeda for Ort and D, and uh, uh, the Pleiades. I said the Pleiades, haven't I? So we've got the Pleiades, Andromeda, Sirius, Orion. Those are the ones that... Uh, and I know the small greys from the Pleiades, um, I don't know specifically where they're all, all from. And the Mantid, where's the Mantid from? Uh, again, I have asked him specifically. Uh, I find that if, if they don't always give me information unless I ask a specific question. Yeah, uh, yeah so I, uh, I, I, I don't fully know. Where, and I think when they did give me, I did ask them once where they were from, and they didn't identify each individual, but they gave me those five areas where they were from. But they're all here now anyway. They're in our solar system. Uh, they're in our galaxy. They're all around us. In fact, one of them, Zark, he has a, a great sense of humor. Uh, when I spoke to him on numerous occasions, uh, when I, I actually felt 
his emotion when he was laughing. If you think laughter is an emotion, which it probably is, but to feel the emotion of a small ET uh, is quite an amazing feeling, really. To see him and to feel the emotion at the same time. But I'm sure they all communicate like that amongst themselves. And they're just teaching me the rudimentaries of uh, different forms of communication, I think. But he moves my wife's personal items around the house. And I asked him why he did that. And he said, because he likes teasing her. He thinks it's funny, but there's a serious side to it. And the serious side is to let her know that we are here, we are amongst you. And uh, okay, okay, so I've got so many questions. <laughs> um, first of all, when you met the Council of Eight, you're obviously communicating with them telepathically when you're, because you're in your astral form, right? You're taken in your astral form uh, to oh, where? No, I think on the, uh, the I was taken physically huh? uh, when, okay. when I was 14. Okay. Uh, I think so, yes. And um, that's my recollection of it. Uh, but the, I think a lot of the other communication has been astral or out of body. Because consciousness can be used for communication, uh, for travel, for creation itself. And they've shown me how to do all those things. And they're the modalities of contact that they use. And I am able to do that as well. So I use consciousness as my telephone as it were uh, and then yeah. obviously yeah so uh, you probably understand that you probably do the same oh, yeah yes i do but i'd like to go into it for people that are listening and watching oh, okay. you, you actually go into it a little bit in the book but let's just get continue to the story there's so many things to ask you so your wife is up to speed with all this i mean did you meet her and, and just tell her your story from the get-go or did you um no, you know, when, I, when i when i met my wife uh, and decided that uh, uh, I was going to ask her to marry me, I thought, well, I'd better tell her some, uh, give her some more information first because if I don't want to get married, then she finds out that uh, I'm able to sense higher conscious beings or spiritual beings or our deceased family members. Uh, so I, I told her, I said, uh, you know, I have these extra abilities. I'm able to detect when there's a change in vibration in the room and when there's maybe a deceased member of family here or higher conscious beings. And she said, uh, well, that's fine. But if you see a, a spirit in the house, can you tell me and let me know? Because I want to see one. Uh, oh, so, she was really open to it. <laughs> so she yeah. was open to the ideas. And, uh, and I couldn't do this without the support of my wife. And, and now the ETs, they interact with her. They show a craft. Um, and uh, if I had a, an interesting experience not so long ago, I was getting up one morning, it was about 8.30, and I thought, oh, I'll just see if I can contact the group of eight and have some interaction with them. So I relaxed, I opened my mind, and uh, I wasn't able to communicate with them, but I communicated with a small craft that was flying past our home. Mm -hmm. And it turned out to be the tier, who I know is a small grey, who was piloting the craft, and I said, what are you doing here? He said, oh, we were in the area uh, and we wanted to come and see where you lived. There was about five or six or seven greys in the craft with him. So we had a little bit of conversation. He said, well, we can't stay because we, uh, we're off course, but we just came to see where you live. So, okay, that's fine. And then they left. Nothing unusual for me. I'm quite happy with that. I got up. My wife had been up about half an hour she fed the dogs. She was sat outside by the pool. And uh, I went to sit down with my coffee. And she said, oh, you've missed the most beautiful rainbow. I said, oh, did you get a photograph of it? She said, yes, I did. And we have five acres at the back. At that time, there was nobody behind us. And the rainbow went from one fence all the way around to the other fence, the full 180 degrees. And uh, she... Uh, she said, we're not going to believe what happened next. I said, no, what happened next? She said, oh, you UFO appeared under the rainbow. I said, did you get a photograph of it? She said, yes, I did. She said, I was actually taking a photograph of the rainbow when it appeared. So I thought, what's that? Lifted it up and clicked the camera on the iPad. And she got a photograph of it. Ooh, uh, maybe, again, you could, on your... maybe you could send me that um, photo and I'll pop it on the YouTube. Okay, I can do, yes. That'd she. The interesting thing about it was that uh, we looked at the time on the photograph 
and it was 8.30 a.m., the time I was speaking to the craft with the occupants. So oh. we had that synchronicity there with the time on the photograph. Um, but she has had the photograph published in the new Observations magazine. Okay. Uh, so, but the craft is a little bit blurred. I suspect that uh, it was just materialized for an instant to show Sandy that they were there and it took off straight away and she just caught it either it was dematerializing or it was moving off at speed uh, but we do see them fairly regular in different forms uh, at the back of the house oh, your your life is amazing you know <laughs> i was one of those kids that you know when they used to talk about ufos and stuff I would go, oh, it'd be so cool if an alien came to say hello or, you know, and I never had any of those experiences as kids. I had other experiences, but not with the UFOs and all that sort of thing. Um, anyway. I'm sure there are many, and there are many of us being asked to speak out now, and I'm uh, connecting with other experiences. Well, exactly. And, and uh, that, that's an amazing, really. that gives me confirmation and confidence to speak about it. And when I speak to people like yourselves who have experiences anyway, we share so much, we have so much in common. And we all help one another uh, expanding our knowledge of our contact with our ET extended family. Yeah, which is, you know, how Susie talks about the second wave of volunteers. She talks about the first wave. It's really interesting. The first waves are what people call the indigos, the star children, the, the, which are the more psychic, heal, the healers of our world, the healers and the teachers. And they've been coming in, you know, well past 100 years and they will, they will continue to come in. It's like this big span of time. There's no finite part of time. But she says the second wave of volunteers are the experiences that have ha that's a more finite. They've sort of come in, the volunteers, if you like, and they've had these experiences and their job is to share it, is to share it. And so all these people are awakening, you know, especially since 2012, they're, they're having the courage to speak up and they're sharing their experiences, writing books. Their guides are saying, right, time for you to write a book, time for you to put your story down on paper. And uh, so, yeah, that would be you. I guess I speak to those people on the show, you know, I'm sort of um, showcasing the second wave. All right, let's get in back to the council. What are you looking at there? You're looking at something. I'm trying, I've got some notes here that uh, so I get everything in order, that's all. Oh, I yeah, hope. we don't have to be in order, but um, okay, <laughs> we, uh, I'll guide you, don't worry, we're all over the shop. Okay, we're back at your 14, you meet the council, why did they summon you? What did they say to you? What was their message? I asked them that, it was just for me to be introduced to them, they were not the other way around actually, they wanted to meet me, that's what they said. Okay. Uh, they wanted to meet me, uh, and that's why I was there. I didn't realise at the time that the audience, it was very similar to our, like our United Nations, where you'll have a panel at the front and then you've got all the delegates that fill up, fill up the amphitheatre. And that's what it was. That's where I was taken to meet with this group. Um, right. I didn't realise that at the time. I now know that uh, I've learned that since then. So, yeah. Uh, I but guess when so. I got to probably the next episode will be after 14, uh, 16, 17, maybe 18 ish. No, but 16, 17 probably. Uh, I know where I was when I was having the experiences. So I associate that where I was by the, the time and how, how old I was. Yeah, yeah. But I was about 16. I left home at 16 and I got my own apartment and uh, I know where I was 16, 17, 18. And it was at that period of time I used to use my out of body just for pleasure. Uh, if I was going to see a friend, say on Sunday, and I think, or walk round to his house, or I better make sure he's at home first before I walk the 15 minutes to his house. So I didn't have a cell phone, I didn't have a vehicle, so I just close my eyes, relax, fly over to his house, see if he was there, and then walk round to his house, and then we would go out for the afternoon or something. Or if on the morning when I used to get the bus to work, I could walk to two separate bus stops, and uh, each route had a, a different line of people. Sometimes there were uh, you know, 30, 40 people waiting to get on a bus. Uh, and the other route might only be four or five. So I used to just leave my body, look at the different routes, and then choose which one to go to. Um, and then if I was coming home from work, it was a nice summer's day, I'd leave my body and just fly behind the bus because it was enjoyable to be 
playing in the sunshine. No, but I wasn't, as I said earlier, I was unable to find anybody else. So one evening, okay, I okay. to I'm going to get back to you, but I just want to ask a question about that. So you're sitting on the bus and you know how to project your consciousness out of your body and fly behind the bus because it's enjoyable, yeah. you say. Yes. So your body sitting on the bus, is it sitting there with its eyes open and aware or are you kind of in a meditative state, like your eyes shut? Like what's your body doing when your consciousness is out of it? Well, that's a very good question. I was always relaxed. I enjoy traveling and I'm, I can relax at the drop of a hat. I'm very yeah, um, cool. able to relax. <laughs> so I may well have had my eyes closed, I don't know. Right, which is yeah. not unusual to see people but on a bus. Clearly, uh, I'm behind the bus. I can see two children on this particular occasion talking about uh, myself uh, sat in a couple of seats in front of them. And they were trying to decipher whether that time the uh, fashion was for men to have long shoulder-length hair. And I had long shoulder-length hair. And then they had these uni uh, coats that either males or females could wear. And the two boys were about nine or ten. And they were trying to decide whether it was a man or a woman sat in front of them four or five seats in front. So Which I was you? listening to that conversation. Yeah. Uh, so when I went back into the body and I got up out of the seat, I said to one of the lads, I said, you were correct. It's a male that was sat in front of me. <laughs> <laughs> they both looked say? at me and you know, I was quite funny but, uh, but again I didn't think it was anything unusual until as I say Kevin I bet you were so cute back then <laughs> <laughs> apple of your mother's eye okay go on <laughs> and, uh, uh, so one evening I went to bed and I thought there's got to be more to this where am I going to get more information I thought I'll ask Orton D so I laid in bed I relaxed or I call it I opened my mind I held my hand out and asked Art, I said, can you give me some more information? There must be a lot more informa information out there and I can't find anybody to teach me. So he came, okay, he took hold of my hand. I left my body with him. I looked down, I could see my body, it was asleep. He went out through the window. I was uh, three stories up and we just flew around the uh, subdivision or the estate. I uh, came back into the window, I looked down, I could see my body, and I went back into my body. Uh, I woke up the following morning, and I thought, uh, well, that was cool. Uh, I wasn't certain whether I was dreaming or whether it was real. So the following evening, I did the same again. I went to bed, I relaxed, I opened my mind, I held my hand out, and asked Ork to come and guide me. He came, he took hold of my hand, I left my body. I looked down, I could see myself asleep. We went out through the window. This time we went a little bit further. Went down into the city centre uh, to Leeds, where I lived at, the, at that time in the UK. We flew around the city centre. I recognised the town hall, the hospital, the university where I worked at the time. And then we flew back, back into the window, and my body was asleep, and I went back down into my body. The third evening, I'm still not fully convinced. Uh, so I asked Art to come again and show me some art. So he comes again, we go out, not this time through the window, because I'm still not certain whether I'm sleepwalking, dreaming or what. So I said, yes, I'm happy to go and travel with you, but um, I'm not happy about going out through the window because we're three stories up and it's concrete pavement below. Can we go out through the roof? And we went out through the roof. And then all subsequent journeys, we left through the roof and we traveled all over on the astral plane as uh, uh, pure conscious energy, uh, sharing, traveling. Uh, and then on one occasion, he said to me, Kevin, I'm going to take you somewhere special this evening. Are you prepared to go with me? I said, yes, I'll go anywhere you want to go. So we left, he took hold of my hand. I looked down, I could see my body asleep. We left through the roof and we traveled up and up and up and up. And I could see the earth getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And then we took what I always describe as a right-hand turn. I think that's the wrong terminology, but that's the words I can use to describe it. I believe we went into a higher dimension. And uh, uh, we went into this higher dimension, and there was a line of people stood there. At the front of the line was my father, my deceased father, who was stood up. I'd never seen him standing because he'd always been in a wheelchair from when I was born. Okay. So to see him standing was... Uh, amazing for me 
and he had a big beaming smile and there was this line of about 30 people and they all welcomed me and this tremendous feeling of love that was given to me from this group and he said Kevin I'm going to introduce it to your family so he introduced me I went down the line I uh, interacted with them and then we got halfway down the line and instead of seeing a physical form I saw a pure conscious energy all again four to six inches in color um, slightly vibrating but I was still able to commun communicate with them telepathically I was able they were able to show me an image of themselves when they were in the last physical and we went I went down the line and spoke to them all and then uh, uh, they wanted me to stay with them and I said no I can't stay here I've got a physical I'm enjoying my physical and I've got things I need to do so on that occasion uh, uh, I left and then but I visited them on many occasions for over a two-year period probably and I got so confident and comfortable with it I would do it on my own without art he'd show me that they were there they uh, are their physical as uh, deceased but their conscious energy still lives on and uh, and the reason why I stopped going to see them was because I was finding it more and more difficult to get back into my body and they were wanting me to stay with them and I said I feel as if I stay with you uh, my physical will die and I have things I need to do and I'm enjoying my physical I'm enjoying being down here on, on earth as it were or down there on earth well, I can't uh, tell you how refreshing that is to hear because most people, you know, who talk about having experiences of being non-physical, uh, talk about how difficult it is to be physical once you've experienced the freedom of, you know, living outside the limitations of the physical body and mind. And to so for somebody who has experienced that freedom to say, I'm enjoying my time in my physical body here on earth with all the challenges that, it, you know, it is to be a human and, you know, hormones kicking in and girlfriend breakups and, you know, trauma, trauma, trauma. And so uh, from that perspective, you seem so enlightened that you can enjoy the ride and not, you know, resist it. Um, yes, I suppose so. I think I was quite fortunate. I didn't fully under, understand the magnitude of it all, I don't think. To me, it was just normal. It was who I was. It was just an extension of our uh, spiritual side, which is part of our... Um, who we are um, and I, I do remember when we decided not to go and see them anymore I was at work, I had a conscious decision, I thought well I'm having difficulty getting back but I cannot just not go and see them again I will ask them uh, I'll go back and visit them this evening and let them know I won't be coming back to see them again so that evening I relaxed I opened my mind, I went up to visit them and again, this huge feeling of love that was there. And again, they didn't want me to leave. But I said, look, if I, if I don't leave, I feel that my physical may die. And as I've said, I'll enjoy my physical. So I won't be coming back to see you again. But I know you're here. I know when my physical does die, you will open me with open arms and tremendous love. So uh, I left. They tried to persuade me to stay, but I left. And I've never been back to visit them since. But as I say... I know they are there, uh, uh, and I can communicate with them if I need to. Yeah. So this is what I want to know. With all this phenomena happening to you, I know that it, it was just so normal to you because, you know, it seems, it seems so weird and strange to people that don't have that experience, right? It, oh, seems, sure. like, yeah, it yeah. seems completely not normal and it seems like, you know, crazy. But to people that are having these experiences, it always seems so normal. I know that when I have experience, it's just, it's just like normal. It's just like breathing. It's so normal. Um, di didn't you ask, uh, didn't you want to sort of talk about it with other people or want more help? I mean, did you ask? I, I or, did you to say find that other people, but I, uh, I, because I wasn't able to, we didn't have obviously computers in those days. Um, I asked my uh, social circle of friends, uh, but no one had any knowledge or any interest in it. So I just accepted it. I didn't talk about it and just went with the flow as it were. And I was, uh, I kept asking for more information, more information, and they kept uh, uh, giving me it. And uh, I had um, uh, an uncle that died and uh, he, he came to visit about three weeks after he died. And uh, that's a, another story. But uh, it was quite interesting, the fact that Sandy, um, 
I know it, he came to the house and he used to smoke a uh, St. Bruno tobacco. And every time he used to come and stay with us, because we don't smoke, we it took about two or three weeks to get rid of the smell of St. Bruno tobacco. <laughs> After he died, there was a smell of some Bruno tobacco in the house. And I didn't tell Sandy he was there until about a week after that. And she said, you're not going to believe this, Kevin, but I can smell some Bruno tobacco. <laughs> and uh, I said, yes, it's Uncle Alec is here. Uh, anyway, uh, uh, he stayed for quite a while, but then he became a, a bit of a nuisance. He was there all the time. <laughs> so I called him, I actually banned him from the house, which I felt guilty. <laughs> Guilty at that, but, but to me, he's just, although his, his physical's gone, he's still there. So I, I banned him from the house. And then it wasn't until I was writing the book, which is probably, I don't know, 30 odd, maybe, what we know, 40, 30 years, 35 years since I banned him from the house. And I was reminiscing about all the different things I've done and the different experiences I had. I thought, oh, I banned Uncle Alex from the house. I thought, oh. That was cool. I shouldn't have done that. So I said to him, I said, and I hadn't had any contact with him since then. And I said, Alec, I'm sorry, I apologise. I shouldn't have banned you from the house, but you're welcome to visit any time. Just don't become a nuisance. So I put that message out there to him. About three days later, I'm Sandy had gone to bed. I'm watching the TV. Uncle Alec appears just by the smell of St. Bruno tobacco. We have a conversation. I said, look, you're welcome any time. Uh, but don't become a nuisance. And uh, he had a complaint. He had the same complaint when he uh, when I first met him. So we addressed that. And uh, then that okay, okay, okay. I have to go back to that. What what was it? Because uh, look, everyone. Okay. So yeah. a lot of people perceive that when you leave your physical body, you've got nothing to complain about. Like, because you're pure. You know, you reemerge to pure positive energy. You're in unconditional love, and there's nothing to complain about. So what would a spirit? complain about was he an earthbound soul or what, had he re-emerged back to broader perspective no, I mean, where what was happening with uncle albert his his complaint was that he died on his own in his own home and that was his complaint oh. but we knew he was dying and he was at my home sandy's home and we asked him to stay with us uh, so we could look after him in those final few days and he was adamant he was going back home. So he went back home. We informed his friends and his neighbours who looked after him where he lived. Uh, that We brought him back. It was his wish. In fact, I thought he died in the vehicle going over. He was that close to death, really. But he wanted to die at home. But when he came back after his death, he complained to me about dying on his own. And he obviously had that opportunity to stay with me and Sunday. And after that 35-year gap, the first thing he did was complain about dying on his own again in the physical. That was the only complaint he had. Anyway, I didn't mention it to Sandy because it was so many years ago. So and Sandy, two, your wife? Sandy's my wife, yeah. Right, okay. mm -hmm. Two days after that, we both are watching the TV. Sandy's in the kitchen. And she said to me, Kevin, you're not going to believe this. I can smell some Bruno tobacco. And I can feel that someone stood next to me. I said, it's Uncle Alec. I spoke to him a few days ago. I explained I felt guilty about banning him from the house. And, and, uh, and I, I told him he's welcome anytime. He hasn't been back since, and he probably won't now, but it, because he knows that he can come. Yeah. Uh, I, had so, some, I had some really interesting communication about all that just then, if you're interested in knowing, if people are interested in knowing. Because, you know, the question begs again, if we re-emerge back to pure positive energy and we don't identify with the personality body complex of who we've been, you know, we're that pure consciousness that's been yep. many. Why is he still engaging in that complaint and that personality? And they were just saying, well, that entity still, still exists and you can, you can re-emerge back into that entity that the thought forms, the complaint, the, to heal that. Because it becomes part of your consciousness, the the lessons. It, anyway, it's, I, I this is a bigger com. I can't this is a say bigger com. Understand it, but uh, uh, yeah. but I know he's happy now. He's yeah, happy. this well, is a bigger that's... conversation than we've got time for here. But they were just okay. giving me. They were just downloading. You know how you talk about your downloads, and you say oh, yeah. you just <laughs> get all this information that comes. Just, 
in an like, instant. In an instant. And to talk about it would take maybe an hour, but you've received it in an instant. So that's yeah. the, what I just got about that, which we could go into on another show. Okay, let me ask you, when you were perceiving Uncle Alec, were you perceiving him through your physical eyes? Like, did you see him standing there as you would see Ort and D? No, no. I no. could feel the uh, change in vibration in the room. And on one occasion, uh, he, he appeared when my brother was there. And um, my brother said, is he here now? I said, yes, he sat in that chair over there. And I could perceive his energy sat in the chair uh, on the other side of the room. Um, you get an image of him in your mind. Yeah. Um, I think you were doing I, what I, I did. I didn't use my third eye to see him, no. It was just purely uh, the, the other senses that we have, being able to pick up on the vibrational frequency, and particularly with Uncle Alec, the smell of that St. Bruno tobacco. Tobacco, yeah. Oh, it's very, very strong. I love the smell of it. I mean, I'm not a smoker, but I do like the smell of St. Bruno tobacco for some reason. But, uh, I, um, okay, so how old were you when he was pestering you and you told him to go away? You were, uh, you were... Oh, probably in my late 20s, early 30s. But so you were probably. already married then, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah we were already married, yes, with okay. Sandy, living okay. in the UK still. Yeah. All right, uh, so we've lost the chronological order, haven't we? But um, we have, yes, but hey, doesn't oh. matter. This is <laughs> it's fascinating. Your experiences are just fascinating. I love the way it all dovetails, you know, because. You're talking about consciousness, you're talking about, you know, talking to the other side or to spirit or to dead people, if you like. You're talking about talking to um, ET beings or higher consciousness beings or aliens, the words, the labels we give, all that. You're talking about talking to spirit guides and spirit, you know, it's kind of like you've got the whole story sort of mixed in one and that's why I love it. It's fascinating. What right. I find is they, they, what they've done, they've, educated me by giving me experiences and the theme and the thread of the education is one of consciousness Conscious, itself conscious. one of shared consciousness right. uh, not just with one another on the planet but with the trees the plants the animals the whole of life the ets our deceased members as we see them that consciousness is a conduit for communication and uh, one might even go as far to say that the our conscious energy is the true life form and we are here in the physical to experience a physical life and learn uh, so it increases our conscious energy and our conscious understanding and when we understand that and you can extend that to the ETs uh, if uh, it takes away any fear of them because we all share that one consciousness and uh, they're here to help us in that transition to a higher level of consciousness ourselves. We're being accelerated in our evolution. And to do that, we have to have an understanding of consciousness. And Absolutely. that's the thread that they've, they've, uh, they've given me. That is the crux of this whole conversation. That's the crux of every conversation I have on the show. That's it. You've just hit the nail on the head, Kevin. You've just put it all in a nutshell. That's it. <laughs> oh, that's good. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's absolutely it's expanding our awareness of our consciousness who we are as infinite potential creative potential who we are as infinite and multi-dimensional beings what's possible for human potential for spiritual potential for consciousness potential who we are we're unlimited to yeah yeah just yeah that's what we're doing here kevin <laughs> that's why you're on the show that's what we're doing here <laughs> expanding that awareness because as humans we compartmentalize we we separate we were we're so polarized that even amongst even within this conversation of life after death and ets and out-of-body experiences you know we're compartmentalizing it all into these different categories and it's really all dovetailing together it's all consciousness it's just all it is, consciousness. Yes. Yeah. it is yes with the which include all the different modalities of contact. And I seem to have been given uh, just about all the different modalities of contact. I mean, they <laughs> use dreams, they use telepathy, uh, they use downloads, which you're aware of. Uh, they obviously use the UFOs themselves, out-of-body experiences, uh, consciousness, even you know physical uh, materialization in, in the bedroom or in the bathroom, uh, channeling, 
Um, the whole uh, gamut. Yeah, yeah, affecting yeah. street lights very often. If they, if I'm given a message or a download, I always ask for confirmation. Not that I need it, but I always ask for confirmation. Usually, there's a synchronicity, and then I'll ask for something specific. Uh, like they give me a download about the quantum unified field theory, uh -huh. which I knew nothing about, and uh, uh, they gave me the download, and uh, I asked them uh, why they'd given me the download. They said, so you have a rudimentary understanding of quantum mechanics and consciousness and where and how it exists. And they explained it to me, and I can't go into it, but I won't today. Um, and, uh, well, that's but, actually uh, fascinating. Um, I, I'd love to read that in the book. Uh, I mean, I know they've given you the download do, uh, because the thing about getting this information, it's, it's not we get the information, but we don't always understand how it works. <laughs> so. No. Well, I'll give you a brief... The, um, Quantum unified field theory was quite simple, really. It, what they said was, your scientists' the current understanding is correct with the four interactions. And the four interactions, I think they said, were the weak force, the strong force, the electromagnetic force, and the gravitational force. However, there's a fifth interaction, which is consciousness itself. And if your scientists include consciousness with their own understanding of their quantum... You know what I'm uh, Oops, and that was we after. lost you. Hang on, uh, hang on. We lost you for a second. If your okay. if your scientists include consciousness themselves with their own understanding of, and that's where we lost you of uh, their unified quantum unified field theory, uh, to in include consciousness with the other four interactions that they already understand and aware of, then that will give them a, a fuller uh, understanding of their own theory itself, that they must include consciousness. Which is how And then it was the same with the, they gave me another download, which was the uh, uh, theory of everything. And they said, again, your scientists have a, a, a good understanding of the theory of everything. However, there's a measurement problem within the calculations. And the measurement problem consciousness C in the calculations and equations and it will solve the measurement problem. The measurement problem relates to space, time, and dimension. Um, again, way above my head, but, uh, and I asked them why they gave me this, and some, some more information they gave me. And um, they said, so I can have a rudimentary understanding of consciousness itself, and I can explain it to others if I need to. Um, so again, I must express it's a rudimentary understanding, they did say that with the um, theory of everything, that our understanding of um, entanglement, no, what did they say? No, I think I have to think what they said now. They said that we are correct with non locality, duality, and entanglement. However, we need to include consciousness again because the non locality and duality with the entanglement of consciousness explains how we're able to communicate with you. Yes. Does that make sense? Oh, well, it absolutely we've... makes sense. I've been thinking about this for years. And the... um, yeah, go on. <laughs> I was just going to say, so the non-locality and the duality means you can be in two places at one time. Yeah. The entanglement is the entanglement of consciousness within the non-locality and duality. That's how it was explained to me. So that explains A, how I'm able to communicate with them, and B, how I'm able to be in two places at one time, using consciousness itself. Does that yeah. make sense? Oh, oh, absolutely, absolutely. You know, no. there's one, there was one other contact modality that we haven't discussed, and that is um, what we've, we've um, looked at on the show. Um, when you were talking about <laughs> when you were a kid wanting to know which bus stop line was less, you know, big, <laughs> and... Uh, you would say that you would leave your body and go there and have a look. You can just project your consciousness. You can stay in your body and just like remote viewing, like remote yeah, view. Exactly the same problem as remote viewing, yes. You, yeah. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. So you, you do, yes. right. So you but don't have to physically view. leave your body like your astral. It, it's just like you just project your consciousness over there and take a look. Like just, uh, I'll go see how what's happening over there. Just it, Well, it, May well be, but my understanding was my consciousness was actually going up there and having a look. 
It was yeah, sort of a, but not your consciousness, but not your astral body. You weren't having oh, an no, astral no, body still, experience. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, oh, I'm okay. Walking. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I would walk out of my apartment, stand at the gate, and then quick zip up to have a look what the line was up there, zip yeah. down there to see what the line was down there, yeah. come back into my body, and then make a choice of where I was going to go. Yeah, right. So one of the questions I posed, while well, I'm thinking of a million questions to ask you, and I get the answers, is I'm like, how, why are they giving this information to Kevin and not to some scientist who can like sort this all out? And they said, because Kevin's much more open than... <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, I get that. <laughs> He's available to receive the information, whereas most scientists are not. <laughs> and I'm like, no, yeah. And I, yeah, I think we, the way our scientists are trained, and we've got some brilliant scientists. Yeah, we have. Uh, yeah, they. Uh, I mean, we wouldn't be where we are today without our scientists, you know. So, uh, but yeah, I suppose the contact with higher conscious beings. I mean, there are more and more scientists now accessing this information themselves. I well, think. you've given and, the clue several times during our conversation. I just relax and open. And that it's in that place of, of, not, of not asking, of not knowing, of not wanting, of not needing, just that place of pure relaxness, that place of peace and just like, and curiosity really, but it's not yeah. like I need to know or I have to know, I want to know. It's just like, show me. It, it's the same place we watch television in. It's a theta yeah. brainwave. It's like, I'm just going to sit and relax and just receive, just watch. It's that, because you've said it many times, I just relaxed and opened. Yeah, and that's yeah, the no, place. Yeah, that's of, right, yes. Yes, I use that term to my wife and says, I don't know, understand what you mean by open your mind. Can you explain it to me? And I said, no. <laughs> <laughs> I just relax and open just my mind. Open. And <laughs> just relax and open. It's just, the, and that's the, that's the whole crux of all this. You know, for people watching or listening to this saying, I want to do that too. How do I have those experiences? Relax and open your mind. Yeah, relax and open. And okay. I think we all have these experiences. We oh, just we do. Have, haven't been taught how to use them yes uh, not exactly. part of our educational system which is it's something i'm passionate about making it a part of our educational system you know like i've got this vision of seeing it taught in every school but before it hits the sort of mainstream schooling system we have to have these smaller educational places like whether it's on the internet like this or in a physical mm -hmm. environment or yeah, yeah. It, we need to just be educated on how to use our consciousness. Yeah, conscious experience. Okay, so where are we with the story? Thank you for the uh, quantum stuff. I loved it. It was beautiful. Okay. And, um, you know, when we really understand that in a practical way, that's when we'll, because uh, so many ETs channeled through different people have said, you know, travel is, doesn't take any time when you understand this. It, it's like, we talk about from our scientist perspective, like traveling to Mars or different planets, it's going to take years or light years or whatever. But when you understand that quantum unified field theory, you can get mass to a different location in no time at all. And so yes. like the beam me up Scotty type stuff. <laughs> I can't say I fully understand it. I can explain what they've, the information they've given to me. And they also gave me an equation for calculating the different vibrational frequencies. And uh, right. they said the difference between the different dimensions is only the vibrational frequency that it exists at. Exactly. And there's a, uh, an equation they gave me for that. But, uh, I don't know anybody, I've, I've given it to a few people, but nobody seems to understand it, which is, which is fine, I'm just the messenger. Oh, I know who you can give it to, like Dr. Rudy Shields. Okay, um, oh, what I want to ask you, I'll connect you with some people that you can give it to. Okay, what I want to ask you is, you know when you said you, um, you went up outside the earth and then you turned right and you're in another dimension and then ORD, 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 O-R-D, O-R-D, ORD, O-R-D, ORD, ORD, O-R-T, T, he showed you how to do that i had i had a lesson in this in a you know in an astral project but i came back into my body and i had no memory of what they said to me but i asked that same question i remember waking up with the uh, like with the memory of saying how do i move through dimensions i knew i wasn't physical i knew i was in another but i wanted to go through 
I wanted to go to different dimensions. Let's not call them higher or lower, just different frequencies. And I was taught, but I woke up into my physical and I can't remember what they taught me. <laughs> what did they say to you about moving through dimensions? How did you get out of this dimension into that place where spirit lives? Just by thought. Yeah, just using by thought. thought. Using thought and consciousness itself. So thought no is particular... A, thought is the creation part of it. And yeah. consciousness is a conduit. But no particular thought? Did they say, you know, think this or feel this? No, or? your own thoughts. If you want to go somewhere, have that thought. Again, relax, open the mind, use consciousness itself as the conduit for travel, for communication, for creation. The three things that okay. consciousness we can use. It for. Okay, okay, I'm getting some downloads about this now too. Uh, so Susie said, interestingly enough, Susie Hansen, I told you about, when she was up on the craft, there was this light elevator in the craft. And she said that when you got into this blue light, you were suspended in this blue light, you would think about where you want to go in the craft and that place was given a symbol. So you would just, you could either think about that place, like I want to go to the kitchen. Let's just use it like a, like a house or bedroom or the office or whatever. And you would be instantly there. Or she said that you could use a symbol that represented that place. And again, you'd think about that symbol and you'd be instantly there. So that's what you're kind of talking about, right? Like using, I suppose so, yes. I, yeah. I don't recall any time being uh, in a blue beam or anything. Uh, <laughs> Just my own, my own thoughts that allow you to um, to, to um, create these things, to create the travel. And uh, uh, I can give you a, another example that's probably out of sequence. Let me just look at my sequence. Here. <laughs> We're going in the chronological <laughs> order of your life experiences. Well, yeah, it just so makes many. it easy to understand, really, I suppose. But uh, uh, I can... <laughs> I suppose um, I, I, I'll just give you another brief example of it. I was about 32, I think, uh, and I'd been at work. I'd done a, a, a double shift where you come home, you have about five hours sleep and go back again at five o'clock in the morning. And uh, when I finished that shift the following day at two o'clock in the afternoon, I was extremely tired. And I usually go to, uh, to bed for a couple of hours till Sandy came home at five o'clock. Mm -hmm. And that was my normal routine because I was tired. On this occasion, uh, I'd taken my dogs out. I had gone upstairs. I had got into bed. And as I got into bed, a shadow person appeared in the bedroom. Now, I'm used to seeing the shadow people. They're just another entity that exists at a certain vibrational frequency. Usually, they're just a bit cheeky. Uh, they like to tease you. And you'll see them at the corner of your eye, disappearing behind a sofa or behind a piece of furniture. Uh, on this occasion, he looked at me directly in the eye and beckoned me, and, which was most unusual. And I, I told him, I said, well, no, I'm tired, go away. I'm not interested in what you've got to say. So he left through the door, he just walked through the door, and he came back a few minutes later and beckoned me again, and he looked directly at me. And I said, no, I'm tired, leave me alone, come back later. So he left, and he came back a third time. I said, oh, you're so persistent, you obviously want to show me something. So I said, right, okay, let, show me what you want me to see. So uh, I got out of bed. I didn't get dressed. I opened the uh, bedroom door onto the landing, and there was a beam of light. And I described the beam as light, like uh, on Star Trek, when they used to transport down to the planet, and it was from floor to ceiling. So I just stepped in it. I thought, you've gone through all this trouble to show me, so I stepped in it. As I stepped in it, I got a feeling of euphoria and uh, uh, just complete euphoria. And then a voice spoke to me, and he said, uh, uh, no, what did he say? Uh, just quite simple, really. I am your father, you are your father's son. And that's all he said. And then uh, about four or five seconds later, the beam disappeared from, my, from the ceiling and the floor and disappeared in my abdomen area. I felt euphoric. And uh, I was no longer tired. At that time, I thought it was my deceased father, but I learned later that it wasn't. Um, but that was uh, a contact from Ra, one of the, the lead council of their group of eight. 
Um, I've spoken to him about that since, and uh, I still don't understand where uh, I am your father, you are your father's son come from. I think he's referring to uh, the a species possibly, or uh, the planet, or whatever. Uh, I haven't got a full answer to that. Uh, but the fact that uh, I was fully energised, euphoric, and uh, uh, I, I didn't go back to bed. Uh, when my wife came home, I told her about the experience, and we went out for a meal that evening. We don't normally go out for a meal because I'm usually too tired. Uh, but yes, that was a, another contact with, again, one of the Council of Eight, or the lead Council of Eight, yes. So, okay, um, so this, um, you know, leads to the question that I've got posed. What is your soul contract with these beings? Did you find out how your soul plays a role in this whole thing? I mean, have you sort of looked at your soul plan? Um, what, you know? My understanding is now, <clears throat> I think we have a soul plan that we agree to before we incarnate in this particular physical. I don't have any particular memory of that. That's just what I've learned over the years in relation to other people that I've listened to, other people that have an understanding of that. And they inform me that that's what we do. All those that are interested in this particular subject and uh, are here to uh, share the knowledge. They're here but to we share the knowledge, yeah. to do that pre-incarnation on this particular incarnation. Did you ever ask Ort, you know, why me, Ort? Why is all this happening to me? Who am I? What, what, what's my role in all of this? Well, no, I didn't because I was just enjoying the uh, absorbing the information uh, the extra traveling, sharing with my extra uh, interdimensional families, as it were. So now I was just laughing it up. I was just enjoying it. I never thought, why me? I just thought, this is who I am. Uh, this is what life is about. Again, it's just normal to me, and uh, uh, I'm quite happy with it. I've never had anything negative happen to me. It's all been positive. So uh, uh, I think I'm very fortunate. And as I say, if they hadn't asked me to talk about it, I wouldn't have mentioned it to anybody. I know. That's the difference between you and I. Here I have this intensely curious mind wanting to know why, who, where, what, what's happening. Oh, right. And you just like sit back and just enjoy the ride. I don't need to ask any questions. This is just fun. <laughs> 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 Which is so interesting. It's the way Esther and Jerry Hicks, the teachings of Abraham, you know, you've heard about the teachings of Abraham. Yes, yes, yes. It's how, that, it's how that teaching came through because Jerry was full of questions, wanted to know the meaning and the whys to everything. Okay. And Esther had no questions. She was just like, <laughs> I'm just enjoying the ride. Look at the pretty cows yeah. outside when she's yeah, driving yeah, in the country. Yeah. It's like, I don't need to know why they're there. It's just, a, so there's okay. that juxtaposition between uh, asking and answering. And yes, that, in that place I, of, of no resistance, in that place of no question, you are this huge open vortex to receive, you know, to receive information, experience. Yeah, that, that resonates with me. As you said that, yes, uh, that does resonate with me. And I do enjoy, as you say, looking at my neighbour's got some cows. <laughs> like the cows, the horses, the nature, the trees. I just feel so privileged to be part of the, all this life. Yeah. Uh, it's an amazing thing, really. And uh, and if you are open, information does come to you. Yeah. At sometimes unexpected times. And, uh, open uh, and joyful. You know, the, the thing that takes me about you is that you're so open and joyful and appreciative. I mean, we, oh, talk about this. we talk about this so much in spiritual teaching. It's like gratitude, gratitude, appreciation, appreciation. The more appreciative you are of life, the higher your vibration, the higher your vibration, the more um, power you have, internal power you have to affect, be more deliberate in how you create your world or affect change in your life or transformation. Yeah. So when I speak to you, you've got all those qualities. You've got that openness, appreciation, joy. Oh, that's very, very kind of you to say that. So uh, okay. <laughs> Where are we on this uh, journey? Okay, so the, the beam of light, which was Ra, I'm your father, you are yeah. your father's son. 
Yeah. Kind of get, it kind of gives you some, you see, uh, that would have sparked about a million questions in me. It didn't seem to spark any questions in you. <laughs> I, well, I, just that. <laughs> I just accepted it. It's, uh, my wife says I don't ask any questions. And uh, I think she thinks it's a fault for not asking questions. But now you've explained it. I think it's probably uh, I'm more acceptable of things and just happy. Just accepting, and yeah, exactly. Just that I'm here, you know, and the, there's so much beauty around us that we miss because we're so busy with our lives. There's all the birds, the insects, the, the animals, the trees, the plants. It's just an amazing place to be. Uh, yeah. But you have to stop and take time uh, to look at it and enjoy it. Stop and smell the roses. Oh, yeah. yeah, stop to smell the roses. Yes, yeah. and we, we just had a trip to New York last weekend, and uh, it's such a vibrant city. We had a great time, but everybody's moving so quickly, they're missing the beauty of life itself. Uh, yes. Well, they probably don't know that, but uh, uh, and they've got great lives up there. But they're so busy going somewhere, you know, whether they're striving for success or striving yeah. for better health or striving to be thinner yeah. and fitter and you know, like richer and just trying to be somewhere instead of being here now. Yeah, I mean, it's a cliche, but yeah, just be uh, here well, now. It is, it is, yeah. And it's all right me talking about it really because Sandy and I. Have, um, I think we're quite privileged in respect that um, we've enjoyed our life together and uh, uh, this is where we are now at this moment in time and we're enjoying this moment in time now. So, uh, uh, it's been a, uh, an unusual journey with its ups and downs like everybody's I'm sure. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, we, we both appreciate where we are I think. Yes, exactly, exactly. All right. Well, let's get back to your journey. Where are we? We've, we've skipped from... Okay, well, I'm, I'm moving, I'm moving on a little bit. Uh, on a little bit on. 30 where you had the um, beam of light experience. And right, okay. Well, a little bit later on now, I'm moving a bit further, much further forward, really. Uh, I was travelling, I'll tell you this story. I was travelling on the astral plane, which I do just for enjoyment, and uh, I travel all over. And on this occasion, uh, a craft came alongside me. Inside the craft were two beings. There was O and D. I was invited onto the craft. I went through the craft, and the skin of the craft was conscious itself. Mm. And inside, O and D uh, showed themselves as a two conscious energy orbs, uh, orangey, yellow in colour, slightly vibrating. I went onto the craft. Uh, I was speaking with them, and they wanted me to share a message with someone. Uh, I can say the name now, uh, Dr. Stephen Greer. They gave me the message to convey to him, and I said uh, that I would convey the message. Uh, however, uh, uh, we had some other conversation, and then uh, I left the craft, and then I went back into the craft, because I said, oh, Dr. Greer will want to know who the message is from. And they said, tell him it's the light beings. I'd never heard of that term before. I expected them to say, tell him it's Orton D. <laughs> and said uh, in the messages from the light beam. So uh, I, I woke up and I came back into my body. I wrote the message down, the time, the date, and the actual message. And then I got up the following morning and I looked at the message and I, I thought, I can't do that. I don't know this man. He'll think I'm mad giving the messages from light beings. So I screwed it up and threw it in the trash. I thought, that's the end of that. The following evening, I went to bed. Uh, I wasn't travelling on the astral plane, and Orton D came to me in a dream and said it was very important that I pass the message on uh, uh, for Dr. Greer's sake. So I thought, the following day I thought about it, and I thought, right, well, I'll have to do something about it. If something happens to him and I haven't given him the message, I would never forgive myself. If I give him the message and he thinks I'm delusional or lunatic, then I can live with that, that won't bother me. Uh, but if something happened to him, I could never live with that. So then I, I thought, well, how am I going to get the message to him? I had heard of him, I don't know him. And so I went to my computer, and I find if I ask for information, it'll come up and I turn my computer on. So I went, so I'll go to YouTube, I put his name in, and the first video on the top right hand side was of the Disclosure Project. And sat next to Dr. Stephen Greer was a guy called Gary Hesseltine. Uh, Gary Hesseltine was a police officer at the time in the area where I worked as a police officer. So 
So that was a direct contact synchronicity there. So to cut a long story short, I contacted Gary Heseltine, who uh, actually uh, publishes the Truth magazine, which I published some uh, an article in later. And uh, I gave him the message. He conveyed it to uh, Dr. Greer. Uh, I got confirmation that he'd received it via Gary Heseltine. And then he sent me a photograph uh, of a light being that he had taken while out on a field trip sometime. So that was confirmation for me. And I felt a weight lifted off my shoulders when I'd given that message. And I asked them uh, later why they'd given me such a difficult message for myself to convey. And they said, because we wanted to see if you would convey messages from us. And, uh, and I did. And I have done a, a couple of others now since then. I do find it difficult to give messages to other people because... Uh, um, um, it's quite strange, someone you don't know talking about uh, extraterrestrial beings giving you a message by telepathy or traveling on the astral plane. But I know on a couple of occasions when I went back and I was traveling on the astral plane, they came along in the craft and uh, I said to them, let me see if I understand this correctly. I said, we are uh, two different species or similar species within different dimensions, fifth and third. We are, three of us are traveling on the astral plane in a craft which is conscious as pure conscious energy orbs. They said, yes, that's correct. So uh, that was, so where we are able to do that, they're able to do that, but we just don't, we haven't been taught how to do it. Yeah. Okay, so one of the questions was, did you know who Stephen Greer was at the time? But you said you did, you, you had heard about him. Uh, and you got the message to him. What was the message? It was, uh, they wanted him to change his itinerary for a particular date. It was in some danger. Was there any, oh, there, I was just going to say any reason for that. He was in some danger. And did he? I don't know. He got the message and that was the end of my job as far as I was concerned. He's still alive and kicking today, so uh, uh, I'm sure. Whether he changed his itinerary or not, I don't know. You would have to ask him. He may not even remember the event, he may not. Look, I'm event. sure he, he might. I'm sure that when something like that happens, you're not the only messenger. So, you know, when, when spirit or higher consciousness or um, non-physical consciousness, what do we call these people, um, yeah. wants to get a message to you, it knocks itself out, you know, and it, and it sort of goes through a few oh, different oh, without a doubt. channels. Yes. Yeah, um, a few different channels, which is... Which is answering a question that I pose when people talk on the internet about that all this stuff, and then they and they always talk about how they're in imminent danger because there is some control force that doesn't want them to talk about it. And I'm thinking, well, couldn't they just knock you off? <laughs> if they didn't well, yeah, want, exactly. you, to, you, know, they didn't want you to talk about it, wouldn't it be easy for you for them just to knock you off? Um, but I, I suspect that um, yeah, there is messages coming through to help people like that, like Greer. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I'm not certain whether he was in any danger or not. That's what they told me. Uh, but my lesson was to uh, to see if I would convey the message, and I did. And you did. And, and have did. you you've been given other... Um... I've been, other, give, been given other messages that I have conveyed, yes. Um, and do yeah. you like doing that sort of thing? Like no. Is that, no. <laughs> I don't want to be your messenger boy. <laughs> no, no, no. No, yeah, I do. Uh, so occasionally, I don't. But uh, I, sometimes I will get messages from deceased family members of you know, other other families, and uh, I don't particularly like doing that. I think it's in, as an intrusion on people's grief and things like that. So I, I don't do that. Um, if the information I'm getting is related to the ETs and um, uh, them revealing themselves to us. Uh, then I will share that information. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you know, I'm just thinking about your bio, how it says UFO. I think we have to stop calling them UFOs because that means unidentified object. And I think that when you're seeing them, when you're perceiving them, you know exactly what you're perceiving. So they're not unidentified at all. They're no, saying, no. oh, there's but, Orts, there's Orts <laughs> ship up there. <laughs> My I, wife took I a see, photo of it. <laughs> I see them all the time in yeah. different uh, uh, locations and they are about and they, they show themselves to me uh, as communication 
Uh, I even in New York, I read. I was just reading an article. I finished reading in the article about UFOs and uh, them showing themselves. I looked out of the window and over uh, the um, central part there, about 20 sparkling lights appeared. There were UFOs just changing formation, letting me know that they were there and confirming I'd read the article and it was important to read the article and things like that. So, uh, but to me, that contact and communication is ongoing all the time. Ongoing all the time. So it's, uh, I, yeah, I, I, so they answered the question before I even asked it. So I was just going to say, you're still receiving this and they've gone, yes, <laughs> that's obvious. And I'm like, okay, okay. All right, we've been yakking for like, it's been nearly two hours. Or maybe it was a bit less because it took me a while to get on because... Yeah, 8 o'clock um, when we started, didn't we? Well, yes, because it took me about half an hour because my camera wouldn't work, which has never happened before. So they do like to play with the electronics. So I just said to them after I rebooted my, cam uh, my computer, okay, guys, help me out here. Can you get the camera working <laughs> again? And there it came. I'm like, thank you. <laughs> so, yeah, they were messing, messing with me, messing with the electronics. How do you feel about doing some channeling? Maybe. Uh, I know you're not feeling real crazy about it. No, I'm not. I'm not at the moment, actually, no. I've, uh, what I've de decided to do in relation to the channeling, I'm going to hold back on it for a while. I've got, um, I've been channeling now for three years, and uh, I, we, I've done it with a small group of people. We've recorded the channeling and written it down, and, uh, and I'm going to put it in the, in the second book. Okay. But my main mission was the in relation to getting the information out in those channels yes. um, I now have probably one or two channels to do that are important uh, so I'm not doing them per se now as for entertainment value shall we say or because I have the message now I have the information I have to put it in my book and um, I'm trying to uh, speak with a group at the United Nations and um, uh, I've already, uh, someone has asked if I can speak to this particular group at the United Nations. Now, if they allow me to speak to this group, then I will do a channel there. Uh, but at the moment, I've decided that I don't really need to. Uh, there's uh, two or three channels out there on the YouTube that people can watch of me doing them. and. Uh, I have this. I have the same message throughout the channels, uh, so I feel as if I, I've accomplished most of that mission now, and I don't need to do. It. I've got a much bigger mission to achieve, um, which I'm currently working towards. And uh, what they're asking me to do, they want to actually reveal themselves in their physical form at our United Nations. Now this has been tried in the past. And uh, we failed, failed to do that. Uh, the last time, I believe, was October the 10th, October the 15th, 2010, by a guy called Stanley Fulham. He had contact exactly the same as mine. I wasn't aware of this until I was interviewed by a guy called Alfred Lambermont Weber. And he was aware of that information. And when I spoke to him about the reveal, and uh, I've actually been given the time and date of when they want to do that and the um how i was given that information i was woken up at uh, uh, february the first this year at 1 1 1 a.m and as i said before there's always a synchronicity they woke me up by the sound of a craft directly above the house now i've heard you say that your birthday is february 2nd right it is. Yeah, yeah. And you're working up on Feb 1st. I've got a couple of good friends whose birthday's on the Feb 1st. I don't know if there's any significance to that, but it's interesting that you say that at 111. So they work you up on the 1st of the 2nd at 111. Interesting. Yeah. So they, they then gave me the location of the reveal, uh, which was the United Nations. So I said, what about the rest of the information? They said that... Uh, they will give me that later, so the time and the date. So I walked into my bathroom and there's a, a street light outside the bathroom window. So I repeated the message back to them. I said, if that message is correct, can you turn that street light off now? And it went off immediately. So that was confirmation for me. 
So I went back into bed and went to sleep. I was woken up at about quarter to eight in the morning by someone jumping on my bed twice. I thought one of my dogs had come into the bedroom. They're not allowed in there, but uh, uh, and jumped on the bed. Anyway, when I opened my eyes, there was nobody there. I was given the second part of the message, which was the uh, date and the time. So I've now got the location, the date, and the time. So um, I then went into the bathroom. It's now daylight. I repeated the message back to them, and I said, right, if this message is correct, can you turn the street light on? Bear in mind it's broad daylight. The street light came on immediately. So that was a confirmation for me. And then a couple of days after that, I was asked to give that information to eight people. And I contacted all eight people, one of them being Dr. Greer, and uh, all prominent people who were working in the field of consciousness or uh, with ETs or UFOs. And uh, I sent them all the email with the time, with the date and the location. So those eight people have that. They can do what they want with that. And uh, I've got no restrictions. They've got no restrictions. What I've decided to do, if I, uh, I'm allowed to speak at the group at the United Nations, I will reveal the date and the time of the uh, reveal when they want to reveal themselves. I'm comfortable doing that now. I'm very confident with the information they've given me. And I, I believe while I was in New York last week, I went down to look at the United Nations, where the building was, how you gain access, and uh, familiarizing myself with the place. And then uh, to see 15 to 20 uh, UFOs appear uh, over the Central Park, I'm sure no one else saw them. But I did after reading the article. That again, that's confirmation for me that I'm on the right path. And I'm hoping in the next few days, uh, the decision has gone to the the executive board to see if I can go and speak to this, it's a spiritual group at the United Nations. So, uh, and if I can get to that point, then I will give them all information in relation to the dates and time, and then they can do with it what they want. We've been here before. Uh, they do stipulate that they want a, a mandate protocol implemented at the UN in relation to receiving the extraterrestrials. I know there are different groups working towards this, the WCETC41, that's the World Coalition for Extraterrestrial Contact, which consists of a group of Russian, Chinese, uh, American and European scientists, leading scientists, I may add, who are lobbying the UN as we speak. And there are other groups lobbying the UN as we speak. I am just a single individual, but reinforcing that, uh, and I have now the date and time. So I will reveal that at that. I know it's not the UN Assembly Hall, but there are people there who are in the spiritual field who work at the United Nations, and it may take me to the next. I, I do what I'm asked to do. Okay. Um, I've got so many conversations going on in my head right now. <laughs> I'm just trying to sort one of them out. Um, the reveal, the reveal. People are talking about disclosure. Lots of people are talking about disclosure. Lots of people saying, why don't they reveal themselves on the light on the White House lawn? It sounds like it sounds like um, as a as mass consciousness who are focused on that, we are creating that because we're the yes. creators of our reality. So there's lots of yes. people saying that. Lots of people saying, why don't they? Why don't they? Why you know? Show yourself. Show yourself. So as a mass consciousness, the more critical mass, you know, the more people that think about it, the more people that ask it, the more people that want it, the more we create that experience. Yes. And um, it sounds like we're creating that experience and you're a big part of that um, experience of disclosure. So what I've been told uh, through channels and from my own mob is that um, many Okay, many some people in the United Nations are very aware of uh, the extraterrestrial thing going on. Uh, so I asked the question when I've heard you talk about this: Why do why do why do they need to do this? And they said simply for that reason that people need that physical proof, you know, rather than the 
contact modalities that we've spoken about like yes. um, I would say so that, that would it's all right for people like myself and other experiences we accept the fact that we are already in contact with the extraterrestrials yeah. the higher consciousness beings and we don't need a disclosure because we yeah. are comfortable with it. but yeah. for all the, the majority of the population who don't know who don't have the abilities are in contact the disclosure is really for them and that will change their perception of who we are and, and yeah. change uh, humanity's uh, future. I did ask why, uh, they, what was special about um, the, the date of the uh, reveal. And they said it wasn't the date of the reveal that was important. It was the day after reveal, which would be the first dawn on a new humanity. Yes, it'll change everything. Okay, I know you're not going to tell us the date, but is it no. soon? Is it like it's in next the next year? I can tell you that it's next, it's next year. year. Well, that's very soon. It is, isn't it? Yeah. So, will I'm I, as you know, you are guided and you are led by your ET guides. They have got me to this stage within eighteen months, yeah. where I can address a group at the United Nations from being just not involved in any of this whatsoever from being be some active. dude called kevin Absolutely. that's had a few experiences absolutely yeah. and uh, if you want to see a channel i ha i was asked by my et guides to put a channel on youtube yes so what i did last year i, in I did community. and i watched it only because i heard you talking about it on another show because i tell you what kevin when i googled you through youtube and youtube's owned by google I couldn't find many other sessions of you talking, no. only two. And it's so, y you know, I know only the, y y the thing about Google is you've got to put, because I put in your name and I put in ET contact and in the title of your YouTube, you didn't have that. And the title helps people find you because yes, Google it picks does. it up. So I sent a message to Sandy on the YouTube saying, you know, if you put Kevin's name and what he's talking about in the title, it'll help people find that, that YouTube. But I'll put the link um, to that under um, the YouTube and I'll put it also on my, uh, my page on my website. I'll put the link to that you channeling that message. And, the, um, um, and he ran up the channel through me and he speaks of um, co-creation of the reveal using our consciousness and their consciousness, which is reinforcing what you said. Yes, uh, we, we're, we're creating it. We're creating it. And what they're saying is, it's, you know, a, a, anything that is created collectively as a consensus reality is created yes. through critical mass. And yes. they've explained this to me through fashion, which was something I was, you know, interested in as okay. a girl, as a young girl. Yes. They said, think about fashion, you know, look at the way that fashion has changed throughout the years, um, you know, throughout the eons of time. And uh, once there's consensus believes that this is what's fashionable it takes critical mass it takes a percentage of people to say yes we agree that this we like this then it just shifts through the minds of you know everybody and um they showed me this by um one time i saw there was years ago in the 90s you know there was this fashion of wearing a singlet over a t-shirt and i remember seeing that thinking that's the most ridiculous thing i've ever seen w within a couple of years i was wearing it and thinking i looked great and they said, see how it worked on you, Karen. And I'm like, yeah, yeah. yeah it's like, when yeah. did I decide that that looked good? At some point, everyone, there were enough people that said, this looks good. And then I was agreeing with them. And this is what consensus reality is all about and how we, how we evolve and shift throughout our collective consciousness. Yeah. I would agree with that. And uh, I've asked my ET guys, the higher conscious beings, whatever you want to call them, uh, is there yeah. anything else they want me to do? Yeah. Um, they, uh, they say, no, just keep uh, talking about your experiences with us and that's what we're asking you to do. So that's what I do. And, uh, but by talking about it, uh, we are raising the vibrational frequency and more and more people are talking about it. And that in itself changes. It's a paradigm shift in our consciousness. And like you say, we then co-create that with the ETs and uh, we'll reach that tipping point. And I've already been told that we have reached that tipping point. We are there now. Yeah. And we have tried this in the past and failed. 
Uh, but obviously they're trying again, so hopefully. But it is dependent on this Monday protocol. And I did actually write to uh, the chairman of the Outer Space, uh, Space Affairs Committee at the UN, uh, Nicholas Hedman's office, and asked him uh, if there was a protocol in place. And he said, no, there wasn't. And then I asked him, how would we do that? And they said, we'll have to get a member state uh, to make a proposal to that effect, a mandate proposal. So I contacted the office of uh, Nikki Haley at the time, um, uh, but I didn't receive a reply from that. Um, but I did what they asked me to do. So, uh, And then they asked me to write to the, the president. So I was a bit, <laughs> I didn't really want to do that. But I thought about it for a couple of weeks. And then I did write to him explaining about the... Uh, uh, reveal about the ETs wanting to contact and uh, and to see if he could follow up with Nikki Haley at the time. And uh, I mailed it, registered mail, um, certified mail. And they did receive it. Uh, and I mailed it on the 29th of July. I remember the date because it was my wife's birthday. So uh, that, that was to President Trump, right? If, if yes, it was. Yes. Trump, mm, be and it was rather asked me to do that one Sunday morning. He woke me up and asked me to do that. And I didn't want to do it. Um, you know, I've done everything else they've asked me, but I realized the importance of it in relation to, as you say, raising that uh, consciousness Aware and the it, fact yeah. that you speak about it. I'm sure President Trump never even read it. It wouldn't have got on his desk. Uh, but the person at the White House will have read it, I'm sure. Um, and um, Yeah, they're telling me that... Um they're telling me that uh, he hasn't read it yet, but they're saying that people have. I want to talk about. I want to talk about the third wave that Susie speaks about, because it's it's interesting that you talk about the day after the reveal is the important date, not the day of the. She said that when the third wave of volunteers are people that are not speaking about this, there are people that are completely consciously aware of who they are, why they're here that have come into this physical life experience to put themselves in positions where they will be inside politics, inside councils, inside business, inside, you know, normal mainstream worlds, doctors and scientists and nurses. And, and they will be in place so that when the shift does hit the fan, <laughs> they will be... <laughs> You've got to say that carefully. <laughs> <laughs> they will be there ready to continue their work and help others acclimate to this new awareness and uh, and sure. they're the third wave of volunteers and she said that and they're not the people like us speaking about it or writing books about it or even going to meditation courses or yoga classes or whatever they're they're kind of aware and maybe they do yoga and meditation but um and they they have they're the social entrepreneurs too. They're the they're the difference makers. They're people that are are inside business and commerce, creating business and commerce. But at the same time, they're giving back to the humanity and to the whole. Like, you know, there's a place there's in Sydney, in Australia, there's Thank You products, and they make products that we buy, like water and soap and stuff. And then the profits go to helping create water and stuff in Africa and stuff like that. You know what social entrepreneurs are yeah, about. So, so they're inside commerce and politics and all sorts of systems and they're the third waivers and they will be known once the shift hits the fan. <laughs> 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 and, uh, and, and again, they're coming in in this arch. They've been coming in for years and they will continue to come in. It's not a finite group of people. Uh, yeah, so it's really fascinating what you said about the day after reveal. Uh, or disclosure, as it's been called. That and I say, if I am allowed to uh, uh, address the uh, spiritual group at the United Nations, I will reveal the date to them. Yeah, yeah. And I will do a, I will do a channel for them, uh, and uh, I know that Art will speak through me, and he will probably give them the uh, dates and time. Yeah. Oh, Kevin, fascinating stuff. Just fascinating i know there's so much more that we could talk about but we probably need to wrap it up now because it's you, you probably need to go to bed it's getting late over there so. <laughs> i'm 45 it is so not too bad 
Ah, <laughs> oh, beautiful. Is there anything else that you'd like to share with people before we wrap it up? Um, no, I must say it's been a pleasure being on your show and I do thank you once again. Uh, I have this message and uh, uh, without people like yourselves, I cannot get this message out there. Right. Uh, exactly. it's, um, but the infrastructure is already there. Uh, I just have to talk about it. I've got the easy bit now. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm happy talking about it. I'm confident in my abilities. I'm confident in, in the information and the ET contact that I have with the different guides with the particular council so i'm very comfortable uh, and um, as i say there are no guarantees uh, if the mandate is not uh, implemented then they obviously uh, won't reveal themselves anyway but uh, uh, we will have to wait and see with that and i say it is next year so not too far to go and if i am accepted to speak at this spiritual group of the united nations i will reveal that date to them and then I'm sure that information will spread throughout the United Nations and throughout the business communities and the humanitarians that are interested in our planet, our humanity. Yes. Well, next year is going to be a big year. I've had many people on the show and my guides have said the same. They've not given me any details. They said, hold on to your hat, kids. You know, <laughs> hats, kids. We're going in for a wild ride next year. There is one, one last thing I could share with you, which I think is important. I recently spoke at a conference, contact and consciousness and contact conference in South Dakota. And uh, uh, while we were there, we had numerous sightings of uh, ET craft. And, uh, um, but while we were there, there was a, uh, a prophecy that uh, I wasn't aware of no one was aware of in relation to ET contact and it was a prophecy given on 20th of July 1969 by a mystic in Brazil called Chico Javier oh Chico Javier yeah hmm. and he said if we had 50 years without a third nuclear uh, third world war sorry uh, then um, we will continue in a long period of peace and the ETs will make um, uh, direct contact in the physical, as it were. Right, well, sure on the know. 20th of July, uh, at that particular conference, a, uh, a craft appeared, and it was there for one hour, 20 minutes. And we all saw it. There were many other crafts seen as well, but for shorter periods of time. Uh, and the date of the craft appearing was the 20th of July, 2019, 50 years to the day of the prophecy. Makes me want to cry. <laughs> oh, wow. When you say a craft, was, did you see it like, a, like a, a cloud shaped like a craft or was it actually visible like a solid craft? It was craft? a visi visible craft. It was fluid in nature. Okay. Around it, it, it had a halo and the silver center to it which was the craft itself was it would stretch out and then i thought it was going to split into three at one time then it would go back into one and it was directly above us for an hour and 20 minutes we all saw it we there were three of us in the group asked the ets to show us the craft and none of us were aware of this prophecy at the time and the uh, the craft did appear now uh, but uh, um it was, I think, possibly it was the caliber of the group that were at the conference that allowed the craft, the level of consciousness there that allowed the craft. I don't think any individual, and certainly not myself, I'm a very small piece in a very large jigsaw, yeah. uh, but the group's consciousness uh, allowed the ETs to show themselves for one hour, 20 minutes. Beautiful. Did you take photos? Any photos of that? We weren't allowed to take photos at the conference, so we didn't take any. So nobody took photos of that? No. Hmm. Oh, I'm sure there's a photo out there somewhere. Because, I mean, because you were outside, weren't you? The craft was outside. You can't take photos outside? Anyway. Yeah, we were outside, but we, at this particular venue, we weren't allowed to take photographs. So that was part of the uh, um, rules and regulations, so I'm saying. And okay. I can't say anymore because it was sensitive. All right, okay. Okay. 
Oh, Kevin, thank you so much again for being on the show. And I look okay. forward to hearing more from you. Uh, uh, I'd love to have you back in the Inner Sanctum next year. We can, things will have changed and um, we'll see what happens. You might be too busy next year because I know that you're going to, I know that I've got you at a time where you're not so busy, but you're going to get really busy being on people's shows and asked to talk. You know, that mandate of yours of speaking is going to become a, a real reality. Well, that's, that's the next big step yeah. in relation for myself. Um, and obviously, and, and I, I as you know, we're all being guided. Uh, the ETs have their own plan. We're just helping along uh, to get to that end goal. They know what the end goal is. They know what's going to happen. And they, they are working towards it. And uh, I could get a message tomorrow, tonight, or uh, asking me to do something else or contact someone else. So, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, but yeah, when you think within 18 months from uh, where when I was asked to write the book to the position I'm in now, it's uh, clearly being guided by some higher oh, yeah. Absolutely. And it's been, as I say, it's been a real joy and a pleasure to have you on the show and to, um, before you get too busy and I'll have to like queue up to get you back on the show. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, you I, I'm serious. I, I, I've loved talking to you, Karen. It's I been very enjoyable. I've thoroughly enjoyed myself. And again, I want to thank you uh, for inviting me because uh, without you I wouldn't be able to get my message out there and I feel your enthusiasm and your vibration in relation to your own contact with your own ET guys which is uh, some which mob. Is well some of them are ETs and some of them are, are not but yeah there's a there's a mob of them yeah there's a oh, yeah. Okay. okay yeah but well, definitely well. the of uh, the um, definitely connected to many races i've asked about who i am because i've got a curious mind and i've been told okay and who uh, did the same well they you said from? you're just as curious as a spirit as you are as a human being you think that you haven't been everywhere and seen everything and i'm like oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> totally <laughs> but like, you don't remember that's the problem <laughs> i don't that's the problem <laughs> exactly <laughs> thanks again for being on the show okay Colin. thank you very much bye-bye Oh, wow. <laughs> I knew Kevin would be a good one. Uh, he, fascinating man. Fascinating man. Fascinating man. As I always do, more chatting with him after I turn off the recording and he revealed so much more. We had so many more chats and I always say, I wish you'd said that on the show. But anyway, you can't talk forever, can you? But fascinating man. I, I'm going to connect him to a whole lot of people so I can get his message out there and talk about this stuff much more. You know, I've had Grant Cameron on the show, Grant's the UFO guy, but he just wants to talk about consciousness now. Everyone wants to talk about lights in the skies and spotting craft and, you know, all that physical evidence. And he goes, yeah, 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 that's, you know, fascinating because we were all craving for that physical evidence. But he wants to talk about consciousness, <laughs> which I think um, Kevin would be a great match with Grant. Talk about consciousness. He's got so much to talk about. So what did you think about all that? Let me know with your um, comments underneath and send me an email if you've got your stories to share because as I was saying, the second wave of volunteers, as Susie says, is about the people that are sharing their experiences and it's not just ET experiences, it's about any experience, talking to your dead relatives, psychic experiences, healing experiences, consciousness experiences, just your experiences with expanded perspective, expanded consciousness your awakening journey to you know a, a different perspective or perception of this physical world and what it's all about and when you awoken and how you awoke and what happened to you as we keep talking about it as we keep sharing our experiences we create this critical mass within the you know collective consensus and we change the world that way that's how the second wave of volunteers are changing the world we're talking <laughs> we're talking we're communicators we're connectors we're talking to each other. We're sharing our experiences. And that's what I do with the shows. And that's what I do in the, you know, the in Awakening Soul series. If you've got a story to share that you maybe don't want to come on camera on the show or you, you, you don't think it's anything much, you know, just write it down. Send it to me on the Awakening, um, what's the name of the website? AwakeningSoulSeries.com website where you can um, send your, submit your story. It doesn't have to be special or different. It just needs to be, you know, I don't know what it needs to be. It needs to be good, I suppose. 
I don't know how I, how I uh, judge that. Uh, okay, I guess you need to be ready to do that. Yeah, and, and many people are not and sometimes it takes them years to get ready and that's what we do in the Inner Sanctum too. I've got people that are um, preparing to share their stuff more and they're writing their things down. We're putting it in the book series and, and they're kind of getting ready to be someone who shares of themselves more. And that in itself is a personal growth you know, journey to put yourself out there as somebody who shares, somebody who talks, somebody who has a, a listenership and audience either through reading books or having a YouTube channel or you know, having a radio show or going on other people's radio shows and sharing their experience. It's, it's uh, not easy to put yourself out there. So many people have had these extraordinary higher dimensional spiritual expanded awareness experiences are very empathic or very sensitive or they're not people that like to put themselves out in front of the camera. They're the behind the scenes people. A bit like Kevin, you know, he said, had my guides not told me to write the book, I would never have told anybody. I wouldn't have spoken about it. And so I'm the, I'm the one that's boots on the ground. You know, it's here in this physical body to help you be uh, a little bit more courageous and coming forward. And uh, that's what I do with my tribe. And um, there are plenty of people out there that are very brave and rambunctious and out there and look at me I've got something to say look at me listen to me listen to me but the people that I attract are not like that I'm actually not like that either it took me years to put my face on YouTube so that's what we do on the show and in the Awakening Soul series and um, we are part of the second wave the second waivers and first waivers and third waivers I think I'm sort of a part of all of it you know the healers yeah the light beings, the star beings, the light workers, the light weavers, the difference makers. More of a generic term, the difference makers. <laughs> anyway, I just loved Kevin. I just thought, I thought he was fascinating. I put him in my sort of, you know, how I rave about Garnet Schulhauser, in that they're a similar age. They don't have similar experience, but they had their guide sort of turn up and say, right, get out there and do your work. At late in the game, you know, late, late in the earth game called physical life, like later in life. 18 months ago it was for Kevin when he said they asked him to write the book and uh, so yeah it was Garnet was 56 when his um, spirit guide Albert turned up and he's in his 60s now and uh, so they're out there sharing their experiences so in that they're similar and they're both delightful beautiful you know easygoing human beings Garnet is like they they're not the big questioners of the world they just sit back and relax and enjoy the journey and both of them have enjoyed their life. They haven't had too many, you know, dramas in life. They've just sort of gone for a great ride. Anyway, I found them similar in many ways. Ah, oh, love you all. <laughs> Thanks again for watching the show. And uh, if you want to talk to Susie Hansen about the third wave, the three waves of volunteers, you know, Dolores Cannon has spoken about it, but Susie just goes into it in much more detail and um and look at who you are where you are and the spectrum and why you're here and what you're here to do you know join us in the inner sanctum she's coming in uh, mid september 15th 16th 16th here in sydney 15th in the us to talk to our tribe and uh you can ask her questions about her experiences as an et contactee dual soul connection her book the dual soul connection is amazing yeah she's amazing as amazing people out there. So next year, big year, next year. <laughs> Watch our kids hold on to your hats. It's going to be a big year. I wonder, I often wonder. My guide said that to me about this year and I haven't found it to be, but maybe not in my life, maybe in the lives of others that had big things happening. Uh, but next year, yeah, we'll have to see what Kevin said about the big reveal. You know, everyone's talking about disclosure, disclosure. If the world at large will be made aware of our cosmic cousins <laughs> our cosmic brothers and sisters we'll see we'll have to wait and see 2020 be interesting anyway i'm going to stop raving now buy the book <laughs> awakened by death come into the inner sanctum if you need some private coaching i'm here to help you with guidance about all this and uh, love you all speak soon <laughs>